Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today I have a nice classical problem on electrostatics. We have two spherical conductors and what we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of charge on one of the spheres, no charge on the other sphere, and then I'm going to connect both of them with a wire. What's going to happen after that is there's going to be a redistribution of those charges and what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much charge goes on one sphere versus the other sphere. Uh, in addition, we're going to calculate the electrical potential. We can also look at the electric field close to the surface of each sphere. What's really nice about this problem is if you understand this problem, you can then try to think about why, what happens when you have an irregular shaped object, such as anything with kind of a sharp point, and you're going to understand why the electric field is sharpest around objects that have a sharp point. Okay, so with that being said, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing on my channel, consider subscribing. And if you have any questions about this problem or something related to it, I'll leave it in the comments section. I'll get back to you. All right, let's get started. All right, so regardless of where the charge was initially, what I'm telling you here is that we have 80 nanocoulombs of charge. So that's important. That is going to be the total charge of the system. Now, once, if it was initially all on sphere number two, Okay, once I connect a wire to it, well, that charge doesn't want to stay there anymore. It wants to redistribute itself. So what I'm going to call the final charge here is going to be Q1 for sphere one and Q2 for sphere two. So there's one important concept here. The first one will be conservation of charge. So what does that mean for this problem? Well, it means if I started with 80 nanocoulombs of charge, that's the total charge, we must have 80 nanocoulomb at the end once everything has been redistributed. So the way you write that as an equation is Q1, that's the final charge on this sphere, plus Q2, the final charge on the smaller sphere, has to be equal to 80. 80 nanocoulomb. You have to have that because charge is neither created nor destroyed. All right, the other important concept, now we have one equation, but we have two unknowns. You cannot solve that, right? So we need at least one other equation in order to solve this. So what we have here are conductors, right? This is a conductor, this is a conductor, and the wire is a conductor. So everything is basically, oops, conduction. I was going to write conductor. Let's try that again. Conductors. Something is very, very special about having this as one total conductor over here. You may have learned that the field inside a conductor, that once you have electrostatics and charge are no longer moving, the field inside has to be equal to zero. Otherwise, there's going to be a net force on the charge, and they're going to continue to move. <laughs> but once you have a static charge distribution, which is going to be on the surface of these conductors, uh, the field inside has to be zero. All right. And if the field is zero, that means something for the electrical potential. The electrical potential has to be equal to a constant value. We don't know what that constant value is yet, but it's going to be the same once you have distribution of charges <laughs> that has kind of happened. You're going to have to have a constant electrical potential everywhere. That's when you're going to stop moving these charges. So we have to use this second concept here in order to uh, calculate or to help us calculate the final charge on uh, these spheres. So if the potential is constant, well, the potential inside this conductor over on the left hand side, the large sphere has to be the same everywhere. And the value actually for this sphere, let's call it V1, is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Now it looks like the potential produced by a point charge right at the center, um, except it's not, because the potential is constant. But at the surface of that conductor, I can calculate the value using this equation, and that's the value of the potential. For sphere number two, the smaller one, you also have an expression that looks very similar, except we have the charge Q2 on the surface of that conductor, and also divided by the radius. So at the end, we have to have V1 equals to V2 once equilibrium has been established. If you substitute both of my equations uh, into this expression over here, what you end up getting here, the 1 over 4 pi epsilon zeros are going to cancel out, and you're going to be left with Q1 divided by R1 must be equal to Q2 divided by R2. If you rearrange this a little bit, let's bring uh, R2 over this side, you get Q2 
equals to R2 over R1 multiplied by Q1. All right, so we have really two equations. This is going to be my first equation from conservation of charge. The second equation comes from the conductor being at constant potential. We call this uh, equipotential. We have two equations and two unknowns. The unknowns are the final charges on each of the spheres. Let's do a little bit of algebra now to obtain how much charge is on each sphere. Right, let's assign some kind of realistic values over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume that uh, the smaller one here has a radius of two centimeters. And this guy here has a radius of, say, make it three times bigger, six centimeters. All right, and our total charge is still 80 nanocoulomb. So let's go ahead now and calculate what Q1 and Q2 are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, Q2 from this one and substitute in equation 1. So let's call it 1 star. 1 star becomes Q1 plus, instead of Q2 now, substitute this, R2 over R1, multiplied by Q1, and that there has to be equal to my total charge. All right, so what else do we have? Um, I can isolate or factor out a Q1, and here we're left with 1 plus R2 over R1. I factor out a Q1, and that has to be equal to Q total. All right, and the last step, you simply isolate by this term here in the fraction. So we have Q1 is Q total. And I always like to do the algebraic method first. I'll substitute the numbers after. It just kind of allows me to make the problem a little bit more general. All right, so here's our final expression for the charge on Q1. And again, at the end, we have that Q1 plus Q2 has to be equal to 80. So let's go ahead now and s actually calculate what is Q1. <laughs> uh, Q1 will be 80. I'll just leave everything in nanocoulombs. There's no need to kind of convert the units. Uh, now, this term here down at the bottom in the denominator is 1 plus. No need to convert since I'm just taking a ratio of the radii here. So I have 2 over, uh, over 6. Okay, this is 80 nanocoulomb. This is 6 over 6 plus 2 over 6, which gives me 8 over 6. Uh, the 8's canceled. And at the end, I'll be left with 60 nanocoulomb. That's this value. Let's try that again. Uh, 60 nanocoulombs for the larger sphere. And that means that this one here has to be 20. Right? You have to have 20 because at the end they have to add up to give me the 80 that I started with. Conservation of charge requires that. All right, so we've calculated how much charge there is on each sphere. Let's now look at how would I calculate the potential. Well, remember, the potential is going to be the same for both. So it doesn't matter which one I consider. Let's consider this one. Right? If I calculate the potential at the surface, the potential at the surface is equal to the potential everywhere. <laughs> we have an equipotential because we have a conductor. So four pi epsilon zero, uh, what else, Q1, and divided by R1. All right, we substitute all the numbers in here. The term in the bracket here, this is like 8.99 times 10 to the nine. Yeah, I'm not gonna write down the units. Uh, we're working in SI units, so let's uh, make sure here that we write the charge here in Coulomb, so we have 60 times 10 to the minus nine Coulomb. And the radius is six centimeters. I could just write that as zero six, and that's automatically in meters. So the potential at the surface here of sphere number one or sphere number two, because the potential is equal, we should get a value of roughly 9,000 volts. All right, we have 9,000 volts here. All right, the second question you can look at now is what is the electric field here for example, right at the surface, and compare it to the electric field right here at the surface. Right, is the electric field bigger or smaller for which one of these? Let's go ahead and do the calculation. For example, we know what the total charge is. Um, we can just calculate what the electric field is for sphere one. Okay, so let's just go ahead that for number one. Uh, let's do the calculation. The electric field here at the surface for one is, again, it's our one over four pi epsilon zero, the constant. Again, multiplied by the charge Q1. In this case, it's divided by the radius, but it's squared, right? Don't forget that. Okay, we can go ahead and substitute in all our values. Uh, you know the charge on uh, the larger sphere is 60 nanocoulomb. 
Uh, the radius was uh, six centimeters. Go ahead and calculate that. What you should end up getting here is uh, roughly 150 times 10 to the three volts per meter. Uh, for sphere number two, go ahead and do the calculation. Same equation, except we substitute in the values for the charge on sphere number two. That's Q2 and divided by the radius of that sphere squared. All right, go ahead and do that calculation. What you're going to end up getting here is uh, E2 is going to be three times bigger. It's three times bigger than E1. So in that case, that gives us 450 times 10 to the 3 volts per meter. So we notice here that this field is bigger, right? Bigger for this one, right? This field right here is 450. It's three times bigger. Let's go try to understand at least why that happens. Why is the field bigger? There's less charge. However, if you compare the area, let's compare the area of two versus the area of one. Since the radius here, this one is three times bigger, it means this area here is going to be nine times the area of two. Uh, one thing about the field due to conductors, the field due to any conductor is actually proportional to the charge density near the surface of that conductor. And actually, it ends up being the charge density divided by epsilon zero near the surface. So if you think about what this charge density is, it's the total charge divided by the total area. So although there is more charge, the area is nine times bigger. So if the area is nine times bigger, well, that means that our charge density, remember sigma here is total charge divided by total area divided by epsilon zero. All right, so here we'd have Q1 and area one. <laughs> so we have three times more charge. However, we have nine times more area. Therefore, the electric field for one has to be three times smaller. Okay. So the electric field is always going to be the biggest if I have an irregularly shaped object such as this one. The electric field is always going to be bigger where regions have a lot of curve, or the radius is really, really small, right? This kind of looks like a sharp piece of object compared at least to the larger sphere, okay? And the electric field was three times bigger in this case. So here are kind of two examples here. In the first one here, we just have an irregularly shaped object. And you notice over here that, and again, you've placed a certain amount of charge Q uh, on this object. All that charge is going to go to the surface. Uh, the field inside here has to be zero, but all the charge is at the surface. In order for E to be zero, again, the charge distribution for an irregularly shaped object is not going to be uniform like a sphere. There's going to be more charge near sharp points. So the charge density here is big compared to the charge density where it's not as sharp. Oops. <laughs> so what does that mean? That means that the electric field, again, the electric field is kind of proportional to that charge density. So since it's very large near the sharp points, the electric field is going to be bigger near those points. In the figure here on the right, what we have here is we have a plate which is not irregularly shaped. But right here, I have another object here. And let's assume here that this one here is positively charged and the plate here is negatively charged. What you're shown here are some of the field lines. And the field lines you can see go like this all the way there. Field lines out here go like this. And where the image is dark, for example, if I look over here, well, let's have a look here in this section over here, where those lines are closely spaced, we have a strong electric field. Again, if you think about the sharpness, there is more charge density is going to be elevated in that region compared to the region, for example, back here. This area over here has a large radius compared to the area right here at the tip of that object. Okay. So sharp objects, again, you're going to have 
charge distribution that is not uniform and there's going to simply be more charge near the tips of the sharp object and that creates larger electric fields. All right, that's it for the problem. Thanks for watching, folks.